Good morning. Uh, I'm Pramod. Uh, I'm a PhD student here, and uh, this welcome to my dissertation defense. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank my uh, advisors, to Professor Amit Chet and uh, Professor T K Prasad, uh, and my committee members uh, who are on uh, on Skype, uh, and my committee member who's already here, uh, Dr. Corey Hansen. Um, I would like to th thank Dr. Payam, Dr. Uh, uh, Shalini Forbes, and, doc uh, and Dr. Bipla Srivastava, who has uh, joined from IBM Research. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll just start with my talk, and I'll uh, first start with a motivational uh, scenario, and then I'll go over the rest of the talk. Uh, one of the things about real-world events is that they are very complex. And you can think about a power grid, for example. It's a very complex system, and in fact, it's system of systems. And there are various ways of monitoring a power grid. There are sensors deployed on the power grid, which constantly streams information about the uh, health of the power grid. And there are people monitoring this information throughout. And it's supposed to be the most efficient, uh, uh, most efficient system, not in terms of power efficiency, but it's a well-monitored system and well-understood system. However, there were blackouts. For example, August 14, 2003, there was a massive blackout in Midwest US. And the US-Canada Power Outage Task Force came up with the diagnosis of the problem. And the problem was that there were twigs and trees that were very close to the power line, and which caused flashover. And that, in turn, resulted in a blackout. So the question to ask here is, Though you have all this instrumentation in the physical world, what information was really missing for these decision makers? And how can we get that information, which is very different from power grid stability equations, for example? So one other thing that we noticed was that on social media, people talk about various complementary things uh, related to power grid. For example, the first tweet there on the left-hand side, it talks about a tree that's very close to the power line. The second tweet talks about a flashover that's actually happening right now. And the third talks about a power line that's down. So you can see that people report events as the event progress. And using this kind of complementary information can be even used for preventive maintenance of power grid. So the idea is that there are real world events. And these events, in order to understand those, just sticking onto one modality is not a good idea. You have to look at different modalities. And in this case, it's uh, social media. Another motivating example is uh, asthma management. And this is, what, this is the project we worked with uh, Dr. Forbes, uh, who's on my committee. Asthma is a multifaceted problem. And there are a lot of symptomatic variations across different people. And to, uh, to understand it, you, you should look at personal level signals, which include, let's say, activity level. Uh, it can also include exhaled nitric oxide, for example. It can also include indoor air quality. So there are various things that you can monitor to understand asthma attacks and what kind of uh, reasons would have caused the asthma attack. However, that's not enough. You have to also consider changing environment. In fact, the changing environment, the drastically changing environment, would result in variations in control level of asthma. And without understanding all these different modalities, you can't really understand the asthma problem. And if you notice that all these observations span physical world, reported on social world, and it's also reported on the cyber world. And let me take another example, which is in the domain of traffic. And because of open data, we have used this as the running use case throughout my dissertation. So I've used, I've implemented a lot of things, I've come up with new ideas, but all of them are evaluated in the context of traffic. That's just because there's a lot of open data. But the ideas apply across the domains. So this is the physical world, representation of the physical world, in fact. So there is a map, and you can see that there is a red patch on the road network indicating delay. Now I was wondering what might be the reason for the delay. So this is sensors monitoring the road network, and delay is what you see here. But the actual reason for the delay is an accident which was reported on social media. So you can see that this information that was reported on social media is very much complementary to what you see here in the physical world, which is through sensor data. And this is report of the same accident on cyber world. So there are various modalities you can see where you need to understand 
an event by actually processing all these modalities. I'm on slide five now, and uh, one of the things you found was that there are, there's a lot of information about all these domains, right? But the question is, can you really utilize it as it is? Unless it's organized and processed in a particular way that's consumable by decision makers, this information is not really useful. And one of the efficient ways of dealing with this in the dynamic world is John Boyd's OODA loop. O, o stands for observe. The second step is orient and decide and act. So this gives you a way of moving from observations to actions. And this is a well accepted standard. And I'll describe each what, of, what, what those each boxes mean in the next slide. Observe step of the OODA loop is about taking as much observations from the environment as you can. So this might include sensor data, this might include social observations, or it can be anything that's instrumented. The orient part of the OODA loop is, now that you have collected all this information from your environment, you want to make sense out of it. And the orient stands with the understanding of those observations. The decide and act phase. So the decide phase le uh, deals with taking actions and then coming up with a sequence of actions. But the act part of the OODA loop is actually carrying out that action in the physical world. Throughout my dissertation, I have three topics. The first one is PCS event ex extraction that aligns with the observe part of the OODA loop. I have the second piece of my dissertation, which is PCS event understanding, which aligns with the orient part of the OODA loop, where you take all these observations and how do you make sense out of it. And the third part of my dissertation is PCS action recommendation, which aligns with decide and act part of the OODA loop. So in this, in this entire talk, I'll be touching upon all these uh, three aspects. So I'm on slide seven. Uh, this is my thesis statement. The first part of my thesis statement is different modalities of data results in complementary, corroborative, and timely information in PCS systems. So you saw all these examples in the initial slide where there were different modalities for observing the same physical event. So my first claim is that if you, if you can process all that information from multiple sources, you would have complementary, corroborative, and timely information. And the second part of my thesis statement is using probabilistic graphical models along with declarative knowledge will help you in interpreting events across different modalities. It will help you extract events, and it will also help you to formalize what is an optimal action. So now I'll revisit this thesis statement later by summarizing the entire talk later. So I have introduced some new terms in, the, in my thesis statement. I think I should just clarify some of those things. For example, what's a probabilistic graphical model? Maybe some of you are familiar with it. It's a marriage between probability theory and graph theory. And probability theory is very well known for dealing with uncertainty. And the graph structure deals with the complexity part of it. So let's try to understand what, what is a PGM through an example. So say Alex wants, Alex is that kid who probably you saw in this third slide. So Alex wants to understand reasons for his asthma attacks. And there are various possible reasons for asthma attacks. Maybe there is medication that he forgot, or he has, he has to, he has, there, are, there are steps that, are, that the person takes on over a day, and that kind of influences asthma attacks. And the polar in the environment also results in asthma attacks. So in order to specify this, because there's a lot of uncertainty, so one way of dealing with this understanding of asthma attack and other related variables in this problem is to specify a joint probability distribution. So what do I mean by joint probability distribution? So for simplicity, let's take all these variables are binary. For example, attack is yes or no. That's, is there an attack on a day or not? And medication can be yes or no. Maybe the person forgets to take medication versus did not forget to take. And steps can be high or low. And pollen can be yes or no. So if you just take these binary variables, which is an ideal case, you will have around 16 probability assignments. So you enumerate all possible values of these variables and assign a probability value. Now how do you come up with those values? That's through a different process. And I'll not get, to into, get into that now. But just a simple model has 16 parameters. So let's simplify this case using some declarative knowledge of the domain. So I know for a fact that 
in in uh, in in case of asthma attacks there are there are two kinds of things one is excise induced asthma and non excise induced asthma so a person having excise induced asthma will have an asthma attack when he does some excises so let's say alex doesn't really have that excise induced asthma right so let me just explain this equations here and then i'll come back to the declarative knowledge that we used to simplify the model so the first equation you see here is just the application of product rule so you can see that this a given msp and msp and then i again repeatedly apply product rule on the second factor here and repeat and again uh, repeat my uh, application of product rule on this factor to get the last equation so i was i was talking to you about declarative knowledge right so let's say the alex doesn't have excise induced asthma then the fact that he has an asthma attack is independent from his activity level let's also consider the other case that alex takes daily medication irrespective of whether he is whether he is found pollen in the environment or not and also whether he is exercising or not so he has daily medication so in that case his taking medication is independent of what's happening in the environment so taking these independencies and applying it in this equation you get this equation and now if you look at the number of probability assignments is just 8 so all the main idea from here to here is that you have 16 probability assignments but you use some knowledge of the domain to reduce the number of probability assignments you have to make this doesn't seem much in this context but if you apply this to a real world problem it's between uh, exponential versus something that you can really manage so pgms deal with uncertainty using parameters and pgms you uh, deal with complexity using structure right so those are the two important things i want to stress on and i also spoke about declarative knowledge and what do i really mean by declarative knowledge is what i just to i just want to uh, talk about here so we have used open street maps which has knowledge of locations points of interest uh, we've also utilized uh, 511 event hierarchy which has traffic related events and it's a hierarchy of events and that's the knowledge of the domain of traffic and that's what i mean by declarative knowledge in this context and conceptnet has lot of uh, common sense related knowledge and uh, linked open data of course is a big collection of knowledge so here is an example of declarative knowledge that's from conceptnet so this is uh, pretty nice because there is a lot of common sense related knowledge in this uh, space and uh, we have used all these things in my dissertation work so revisiting my three pieces of my dissertation in the first pcs event extraction part we asked those research questions what are the events of interest right if you know these events of interest can you extract from observational data and what is the role of declarative knowledge in doing this extraction so those are the questions i asked here and in the second part which is pcs event understanding i asked question something like how do one event influence the other and can we study this dynamics of these events as it evolves and and the other important question was if there are events in different modalities can you infer correlation between them and can you understand the event thereby and in the action recommendation part i i uh, i've investigated on how do you represent tasks and actions and this is the work i did with uh, cory at bosch uh, so how do you use declarative knowledge of tasks to specify a probabilistic model so those are the kinds of questions uh, i've asked in this uh, third part so i'll start with this how do we infer interactions between multimodal observations and then i move to the event extraction part and then summarize the action recommendation part because that's the logical flow i see in this uh, talk so this work was presented at the triple ai uh, uh, 2016 conference in february so first of all why let's ask why do we even want to integrate multimodal data so maybe one modality can provide complementary information to the other for example you saw the power grid example where there were these sensor sensor observations but there was a social media that that was providing very complementary information to that so why do we want to integrate these two because we could use one modality for example we could use textual events to interpret sensor data right and most of the work since state of the art dealt with one modality and uh, here is a example where you can use multiple modalities to understand real world events 
So what do we how do we what, what do we do in order to get this? So first we need to see if there are really these data sets that are available. Uh, in fact, 511.org is a great source of traffic uh, related information. So they give out near real time speed and travel time observations. So they give average speed of vehicles passing through each link in the road network from San Francisco Bay Area. So that's the sensor observations we have. We also have textual observations from 511, which is incident reports. So there can be planned events and scheduled events. Uh, or, or, or sorry, there can be scheduled events and uh, impromptu events. The other source that we were looking for was uh, from tweets, some social media. And that's the other place where we extract traffic related events. Now that we have seen that there is really data source which has this uh, real world event and multiple modalities which is sensor data and numerical data. Now let us see how do we achieve this integration of these two different modalities. The first step is to extract actual events. Twitter doesn't give me events. Twitter gives me mention of some entities that might be related to an event. So I need to abstract out and say what are the events, right? So that's the first part. The second part, we have sensor data. And this sensor data is very complex. And I'll show you why it is complex. And I'll talk about some of the theoretical uh, aspects and some challenges in this part. And the second step is to really build a statistical model that summarizes this variation in sensor data, thereby characterizing what is normal and anomaly. Because at the, in the third step, we want to correlate these two modalities, which is one is text, one is sensor data. I have anomalies that are tagged in sensor data. Then I have these textual events. I want to tie them together. So that's the third step. So let me go to the first step. And uh, the first step is based on the journal paper we have in ACM transactions. Uh, the question that we are trying to address here is, how can we extract events from textual information? So you might ask me, are there really textual events about a city? In fact, uh, IBM has these various departments listed on their website. And I was just curious. And I found that there are tweets related to each and every department that was listed there. And particularly, we are interested in the transportation uh, related uh, tweets. So here's the overall architecture of uh, the event extraction process. There are two steps. One is city event annotation. And the second one is event extraction. All you need to know from this step is the input is tweets, which is from a bounding box, which can be a city. And the output is this tuple. This tuple is nothing but an event. This is not a tweet. It's a tuple which summarizes whatever is happening in a city in, in terms of events. And these are traffic events that I'm trying to extract. So this tuple has event type information. For example, it can be an accident, or it can be a scheduled event, or a planned event. It has location information. That is, where is this event really happening? And there is start time and end time. And I have a, the other information is the impact. Like how impactful is this event? So these are the kinds of things we are looking for. And when I say an event, it's this quintuple here. So the input is tweets, output is these events. So let me go over step by step. Uh, the first step I told you was uh, city event annotation. right? And we used a uh, sequence labeling technique, uh, which is a conditional random field to annotate these uh, various uh, words or tokens in a tweet. And to give you an intuition of what a CRF is, let's say I give you these images and ask you what the person is doing in the image. right? So the first image, I can say it's le he's sleeping. And let's take this image. I, I need not label it. I just use it as a context for labeling the next image. So maybe the person is driving. right? And I see this, oh, maybe it's a gym, and then the person is exercising. Let me present the same sequence but with a slight change. So here I have this image, which is a concert. So now if, I ask, if you ask me, I just label these as driving, I'll probably say singing rather than exercising. So you can see how the sequence matters a lot when you're trying to label these sequences. In fact, this really caused the, this is the reason why we said it's singing, right? So this was entertaining, but uh, this is how a conditional random field looks like. But the overall idea is that you assign, so a tweet has tokens, and each token has a tag. The way a conditional random field assigns tags is based on global normalization. That is, I assign the tag that's best possible tags for each and every token. So I do this global normalization. It's not just one token and a tag, but I look at the entire sentence to do this. 
And here is an example of a tweet that's uh, uh, having this location, which is Half Moon Bay Brewing. So that's the location. And this is done by our uh, annotation technique. And we'll revisit this in the evaluation part of it. OK, now that we have annotated these tweets, we want to summarize them and extract these events. Remember that quintuple I was talking about? So this step deals with taking all the annotated tweets and emitting that quintuple. And we do so using something called geohash. And geohash is a way to compartmentalize a city into smaller grids. And you can only look at each grid and summarize whatever you have. Like say you have annotated some tweets, and you summarize those and emit those events. So we did some evaluation on the uh, city event annotation and extraction. So let me go into annotation part. So on the left, you can see the, uh, I'm on slide 22. Um, you can, on, in, on the left side, you see the baseline annotation model. Uh, this was done by Alan Ritter. Uh, this was published at CKDD. Um, so they, this is a generic city, uh, sorry, it's, it's a generic annotation model which annotates entities in a tweet. So we came up with our own annotation model, which utilized declarative knowledge of locations and events in the city. And that reflected in the potentials in the CRF model. So the way the CRF model was built is through complementing it with all this knowledge that we have about the city itself. And because of that, you can see that we did perform well on the event extraction part. And this particular model doesn't have any manual intervention. So this, they required some manual intervention. So this did not require any manual intervention for uh, creating these models. So I'll give you some examples of, uh, I, uh, in my thesis statement, I had complementary, corroborative, and timely. right? So now let's really look at the problem and uh, understand what kind of events that we have extracted and why is it complementary or corroborative or timely. So here is an example of a complementary event. So on the right side, you see the events that were reported by an official source, which is 511.org. It reported that there was some construction. And on the left-hand side is what you see that we have extracted from Twitter. And traffic is complementary to construction. We say an event is complementary if it is giving some additional information rather than saying the same thing. So in the next slide, you will see that uh, it's saying the same thing. So now it's corroborative. So the official report said there was a fog here. And we extracted that. There was a fog. In, yeah. in the previous slide, though, you showed the location to be quite different, right, for the uh, right. Uh, thing. In, uh, right, in right, right, right. Looking, I have, even though I know a little bit about the area, right, right, how right. How would you uh, argue that uh, that particular traffic uh, is actually associated with that? Right. Uh, and do you use that this is on this connected set of links that are significantly close enough or whatever, right. you know? Or did you mention the location, but he tweeted it from different location? Right. What are the things? I mean, if I got uh, this tweet from another 200 meter off, would you still consider it to be uh, uh, for the same, you know, the right. connection between that uh, thing or not? Right. Um, that's a that's a great question. So, for example, the 200 meters thing just you said. Mm. So it may happen that there are two events which are 200 meters apart, mm. but still they are not complementary because roads have its own directions. Like there are different lanes. Mm. There is one lane and the other lane coming in the opposite direction. So again, we have to look at the links. And uh, here is an example. I, 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 don't, I don't know if there is a link that exactly goes through that location. But we have evaluated for multiple cases, and it's an example. So it's, it's, it's going to be challenging to even figure out what events are really uh, doing this complementary thing here, unless unless you exactly know and verify it physically. Well, uh, for example, tweet says that uh, that uh, construction is creating problem, and now you right. can be sure. Right. But, uh, right. But right. that if there is nothing else. Right. In that case, uh, it becomes a corroborative tweet, Dokshet. So if it is a construction they mention, then it becomes corroborative. Yes, but in this case, how does it complement? I don't understand. Uh, how can you be sure that this complements that particular? Thing of I'm not claiming about this particular thing. Okay. I'm just saying that if, if, are, if there are two different sources that you're getting information from, mm. one can provide, there are different possibilities. And the first possibility is complementary. And it, it, there are various things. This is just traffic domain, right? 
if you consider a health domain, you have to come up with a very case specific things of how one complements the other. So it's it seems to be that. Uh, so if you have taken that file file level dot org uh, event uh, of uh, road work and so found one? a yeah. tweet that said uh, that road work has resulted into a uh, thirty minute delay. Right. That would be very nice. Right. Uh, right. So delay is complementary to construction. Right. 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 But in this case, I didn't see that. This I see that that you are talking about the idea, but not, the example is not very specific to that. Situation. Right, right. I mean, I, I, I am not claiming for this example, but the idea is that if you have these different modalities, you could have complementary information. Uh, yeah. Is it possible that both of them are the same hash that you, you, you mentioned before? Yes, it's possible, yeah. So See, again, that's again a complexity because, um, as Dr. Shet mentioned, there might be two events that are very close, but they are on the opposite sides of the directions of the lane. And there are two events that are probably this few miles apart, but it's on the same link. So you need to consider the directionality in which we are talking about, I guess. Even though these two may not be in the same grid, but it still kind of extends across the grids. But that's a Something good point. Would be easier if it was on that bridge, for example, that would be easier to say. Right. Where, because there's only one road going. Right. If it is yeah. you know, here, there are many roads going, and particularly there are two highways there. Right. Uh, 80. And 101. Right, uh, right, right. And 80, 83. So which one actually leads to that? You cannot tie. An event that is far, you know, right, right, right. Org, uh, location that is not on the same, uh, you know, yeah. road, for example, would be yeah. hard to argue. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, and, and also I think we had another uh, issue, which is that even if the tweet is reporting an event uh, that is physically there, the tweet may have been generated uh, later at a different point. <laughs> and and so we had to make uh, yeah. approximations to to guess at. Uh, I, I, but I, I think because you have so much data, I would urge you to replace this slide with one where it explicitly gives complementary information about that particular thing. Okay. Yeah. Rather than just saying idea, show one example. Sure, sure. This is a real example. Whatever yeah, you see the, here. The, the, the Complementary thing is not. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is not complementary. This is corroborative. I know, but the complementary example is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, doctor. That will be done. So in this is a case where we have fog Sorry, report. Uh, just yeah. A, I have to tweet them. Just yeah. back to what you were saying. It seems to me you don't have enough semantics here to understand all the things you were talking about, perhaps. So which side of the road is the, tr the construction happening? How close does the traffic need to be to the construction in order for that relationship to manifest? So perhaps you know you have to just say that because these occurred within the same geospatial mm, region, okay. right. and there's some right. probability that that relationship is. Okay. So, okay. so I think okay. what you'll have to do is so a statistical it's measure of symmetry. If it is done that way, uh, it still should uh, positively uh, demonstrate that particular example. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it, it will all depend also largely on the particular type of event you want. Right. So, right. so you, if you specifically look for a road work or something and traffic, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so so there is a known file event on file eleven dot org that talks about a sports event or entertainment event. Right. And the tweet says uh, you know the, uh, something about that event. Yeah. Now you yeah. can argue because the amount of semantics necessary is very limited. Right. And the text already gives you some help. Yeah. Yeah. Without yeah. that. Uh, yeah, as Corinne mentioned, there will be, uh, you know, so it is not captured enough. Yes, it's very Even if it's captured uncertain. Table, perhaps with the model, the particular data. Absolutely, so yeah. Th then, then only thing you can need is uh, statistical when you need multiple, uh, you know, um, data points to... Yeah, in fact, I'll talk about how do you capture these uncertainties in the second part of my talk. Uh, it's not in this context, but I like the example of taking one highway and maybe just looking at... And also bringing in the semantics probably would be the just look thing. at the main bridge or something along that line. Yeah, and focusing on that will help. Right, right, right. right. Just as to give the concrete example. That's yeah, right. yeah. Now, how many of those are available? That would be a question. Yeah, that's the and harder uh, part. Again, yeah. it will all depend on the very specific thing. You focus on a three-hour window of a sports or a major arena event. Uh, you would probably like you find much more of you know yeah. things that would people might report it. traffic jam yeah. for example which is complementary that is uh, relatively small yeah for that area right and right perturbations right. are relatively small 
and many such possible things are there nearby, right? Uh, then you, you know, would have heard that. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Did you, uh, did you encounter any kind of contradicting events information? And if yes, how did you deal with it? What do you mean contradicting? I mean, in this context of traffic. Yeah. Now, what do you mean contradicting? I mean, uh, maybe a tweet reporting a kind of um, traffic and other tweets. I mean, uh, no, but for example, if you think accident, right? People say there is an accident, but people not report there is no accident. You see? Is that what you mean by contradictory? Yeah. Or? I mean, people don't usually do that. So, there is uncertainty aspect where for example people report events and I don't really see a delay in sensor data for example mm -hmm. so I don't know if I should call it contradictory but it's more like uncertainty so there is a lot of such things in this data set and uh, I'll talk about the real world data sets that we deal with here and it's a lot of such things here in this place so the we saw co we saw complementary, corroborative, and the timely part of it. You can see that the event that we extracted from Twitter was before the event that was given by 511. So we use this extraction technique uh, for one year worth of data. So we collected from May 2014 to 2015. Uh, we have collected data from both 511.org and Twitter. So we collected over 20 million tweets from San Francisco Bay Area, and we have extracted around 39,000 traffic related events from 20 million tweets. So just to summarize, we have just finished the event extraction part. right? And next I'll talk about the messy nature of sensor data and how do we really deal with it. So here is a plot of variation of speed over time for, a, for one day. The y-axis is speed in kilometers per hour. The x-axis is just time of the day. So this is a very complex nonlinear time series data, right? So it's varying all over the place. And just try to step back from this problem and we'll see what are the challenges involved if we have to really summarize this or if we have to model this using a statistical model. One of the challenges is there are multiple events that influence these different uh, traffic dynamics. So we have to account for all these events when we are dealing with it. And we may not have complete information, right? So I'm not sure that I have all the events in the city that I know I should be knowing. There is varying influence for each of those events. And there are event interactions, which is very complex, right? So th these are various complexities that are involved. And uh, let's look at some of the reasons for those nonlinearities, right? The first one might be just the temporal landmark. So just peak hour traffic versus off peak hour. So that might result in a, a dip in speed, for example. The links that are near downtown versus residential areas, they might have very different dynamics. So that might be one of the reasons why you can see that there are varying dips. And there, there are various scheduled events in a city, and those causes, again, variation in speed. And there are some unexpected events that you don't really account for. Uh, and that results in uh, various uh, dynamics that you see. It's, com it's highly nonlinear dynamics you see there. And it might just be a random effect. So people just decide to go to downtown on a particular day. And it happens to be a coincidence, and there is a dip in speed. So there are various reasons for nonlinearity, as you saw. Uh, but let's take a closer look at the problem and see how we can really model uh, traffic dynamics. The first image on the left side, I'm on slide 30. So you can see that there are various events in a city. And all these events have people as actors. So people come to the city to participate in these events. Now the question is, do I know how many people are coming? Not exactly. I don't have an exact count of how many people are coming to the city for these events. They take various modes of transportation. Do I know what kind of transportation they are taking? Maybe public transport, or they're bringing their own vehicle? Again, I don't know about that. <coughs> All I have access to is speed of vehicles. 511.org gives me only speed of vehicles that are passing through each of the links in the road network. It doesn't tell me anything about all the things on the left-hand side. So there are two things to this problem. One, there are hidden states. I don't know exactly what these states are. But all I know is vehicle speed. And I keep talking about links. And what do I mean by links? A link in a road network is a small part of the road. So a road is a combination of links uh, arranged together. So now let's look at this nature of the problem of uh, traffic dynamics modeling. There are various hidden states. And the observed state is dependent on the hidden state. So that's the first thing that comes to my mind. 
And the current hidden state influences the current observed state. And there is this continuity. So people don't just disappear from the city. They go out slowly. So there is this continuity that you see here. So there is a continuation in the hidden states. So you saw that there are three hidden variables. There are events, people, and how many, how many, uh, sorry, how many vehicles are there on the road network. Right? These are the three states. But let's simplify it and say that volume is a hidden variable for us, and speed is what we observe. This, the volume, so this makes sense because on a particular link, how occupied it is dictates how fast you can go in the link. So it directly influences speed. So we are simplifying the problem and saying that volume is the hidden state and speed is what is observed. So in the previous slide, you showed three hidden variables and one observed variable. Considerations there are in um, saying because if you have very small amount of observed thing and too many quote unquote hidden things, right? Then uh, it appears. I mean, I, I would guess that that is not optimal compared to when there is some, you know, more observed and you know comparable number of observed to hidden things. Right. Absolutely. So, how so do you do that? How, why did you? Argue, can you argue that these three hidden and one? observed can be effectively modeled and why? No, that is the thing. So if there are three hidden states, I'm not modeling three hidden states. I'm simplifying one mm. because that directly influences speed mm. and it's kind of simplifying the problem. So we have this real world which is very complex, but we use a simpler notation and a simpler mathematical model to capture that. So yeah, that's a good question. I can't probably model all of them and if I do so, I might fail with whatever observations I have. So there was also some, some formal method of uh, measuring incompleteness, right, of the things they were all, yeah. And, and that, that more, less the data and points of observed things, more uncertain you are about uh, the quality of your. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So in our case, we don't even know that, Dokshit. Like, whatever is hidden, mm -hmm. it's not even told to me. Like, I can't even get access to this data. So if at all I have a ground truth data which has, okay, here are the people that really came into the city and here is the speed I observe, then I have at least a hope of modeling it. Mm. Otherwise, uh, there is no hope of modeling that part. Yeah, I think another way of saying that is that we do not have enough information to discriminate among these finer details and so we are lumping them together. Which is the volume. Because they all impact the observed thing and so because we are unable to distinguish it, we are saying, okay, let's put them all mm -hmm. together. The whole thing then comes down to exploiting variety of things. Just to give you an example, it is possible that there is some correlation between how full is the um, uh, city parking lot to the amount of traffic in that particular area. Uh, at least uh, mm -hmm. with regards to a time slot of evening. I mean, you may not correlate that well with, uh, uh, let's say, afternoon and evening, but just say, consistently in the evenings, uh, mm -hmm. the, you know, you will observe that on Saturday and Sunday there is a lot more cars there, so evening traffic is higher uh, in the city, while in the day city is not that occupied. And so one says that in addition to the things that you will be observing, uh, one modality, like the you know volume or speed on the road or the leaks, uh, suddenly you add totally you mm -hmm. know, another kind of stuff to as an approximate measure, right. you have something, you know, more, more and more of these things are. I mean, Absolutely. Reducing the uncertainty mm -hmm. uh, means adding more and more relevant data. Yeah. Actually, let mm -hmm. me give you a very concrete example. I think we haven't included that slide here. Mm -hmm. But uh, we found that we were expecting uh, the delays to be in the morning uh, traffic hour and the evening traffic hour. <laughs> and then uh, there was a concrete link where we repeatedly saw that there was a delay in the evening but not in the morning. And uh, later on, we actually scrutinized <laughs> and we found that it was actually a one-way street. Mm. And, and that's where we felt uh, really good. So it's something similar to what you're just uh, saying, that we observed something and then we were able to actually account for it by studying the map uh, of the mm -hmm. area. The other, the other thing is to always, uh, you know, one of the most important things that, that he talked about, at least for me, is um, uh, that he was in that reader comparison to the reader thing that he was able to use that uh, knowledge uh, and uh, make it uh, no, you know automated as well as get better results. That is the fundamental thing you can repeat everywhere in what kind of research we do. Um, uh, so um, 
you could bring to uh, here where the um, geospatial models, like the mm -hmm. work that Max Egenhofer used to do, uh, you know, semantic mm -hmm. uh, modeling of spatial, uh, geospatial mm -hmm. data. Uh, and so there, uh, those models uh, that exist mm -hmm. would all give you the directions, would already have the knowledge that this city is one way. Would already have mm -hmm. knowledge that there is a stop sign. Would already have knowledge that there is a, uh, you know, traffic light. Signal line. light, yeah. And many of those things. Now that suddenly adds richness. Now, you know, if you can make that, make that uh, knowledge, link that knowledge to computational yeah. thing, you suddenly have something, you know, More significant. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I was talking about hidden and observed state. So here, I'm just drawing a link, which means that the current hidden state influences the current observed state. That is, how occupied the link is right now dictates how fast I can go in that link. And the volume at this step depends volume on the previous step, volume in the previous step. So there is this continuity. So people don't just disappear, but it goes slowly. And this model that you see here is nothing but a linear dynamical system. And it's called by different names. Uh, it's also called Kalman filters. Uh, but this is what I'll consistently use throughout the talk. So now that I have spoken about LDS, uh, this is just the representation, right? So you want to see how what this model really captures. But these are continuous variables. Volume is continuous. The speed observations are continuous. So it's very complex to directly deal with it. So let's take a simplifying model where let's, let's simplify it and say there are discrete variables. And let's say let's take a scenario. So let's say you're in an underground facility. You don't have access to the external world. But you want to estimate the probability that it's raining outside, or not raining outside. That's a binary variable. And you, all you have access to is the people coming to that facility. Whether they are carrying an umbrella or not, that's your observation. So umbrella U observation captures yes or no. So there are two things to this model. One is the red link that you see, which is the transition model. So the fact that it's raining, uh, it's going to rain tomorrow depends on all the days in the past. However, I'll make a simplifying assumption, which is called first order Markov assumption, which means that I'm, say, I'm saying that today, if it's going to rain or not, is dictated by whether it's raining yesterday, whether it was raining yesterday. So he, here are some of the assumptions I'll talk about. And this is applied throughout the modeling part of uh, my work. And the second part is the observation model that specifies the sensor Markov assumption here, which is the current hidden state dictates the current observed state. I already spoke about it. And this makes sense for the context of traffic uh, example we have. And, this, and the last one, last assumption is the stationary process. So what stationary process really means is that the data is evolving over time. It's not that the data is stationary. But the distribution from which you draw these samples is stationary. So that's what it means. So here is how you parameterize this model. The way you read this is that probability that it's going, it's, it's going to rain today, given that it was raining yesterday, was 0.7. Probability that it is going to rain today, given that it was not raining yesterday, is 0.3. Similarly here, probability that the person is carrying an umbrella, given that it's raining today, is 90%. So similarly, you just read this kind of uh, parameters for this model. So now that we understand there are two important things, one is transition probability model, and there is also the observation probability model. So let's revisit the LDS model. So now just replace those discrete variables you had with continuous variables, and you get a linear, a linear dynamical system. And it's exactly the similar uh, thing. So you have transition model and an observation model. That's exactly what these two equations correspond to. The first one corresponds to a transition model, how the hidden state really evolves over time with some Gaussian noise. And the second equation is the observation model that you saw. So this dictates what is the current observation given the current hidden state. And this is the joint probability distribution that's specified for the LDS model. Uh, so it's basically capturing all the hidden states and the observed states. So now that I have described to you a plausible model that you can use for modeling this problem, let's really look at the data set. And this is a messy graph, but let me try to uh, explain what it is. So this is an hourly plot of average speed of vehicles passing through a link in the road network for all Mondays for six months. 
So I take data from August to January, which is six months. I choose all Mondays. Then I plot an hourly distribution of all the, sorry, hourly plot of all the observations. So there are, there's one thing to notice here. There is a solid black line and a dotted line. So the dotted line is the mean, and the solid line is the medoid. And I'll talk about this again. The, I'll revisit that later. So the green box part of the plots, you can see that it's steady state dynamics mostly. So it's either, it's just at steady state. Whereas the red ones are what is interesting to us. So either it's increasing, decreasing, or it's just low speed. So one thing to notice, let's ask a critical question. I just described to you a linear model. Can I just use one linear model to capture the entire set of variations? Maybe not. It's unrealistic, right? Because each part is very different. Like There is a behavior that's kind of switching between different linear models here. So to capture this, there is something called switching linear dynamical systems. I'm on slide 36, which describes the uh, switching linear dynamical system. What do I mean by SLDS? So there is a discrete switch that chooses a particular linear dynamics. So depending on the switch variable, I choose the linear dynamics for that particular time. And then I keep switching between different linear uh, regimes. And that is what is uh, switching linear dynamical systems. If HT is a switch, so you choose a particular transition model, you choose a particular emission model based on the discrete switch. So we proposed uh, something called restricted switching linear dynamical systems. And this is the AAAI paper that we submitted uh, in 2016 and presented in February. So we removed the Markovian transitions. That is, based on our problem, the switch for us is day of week and hour of day. And there is nothing uncertain about it. Given any data point, I know when it was generated. What is the day of week? What is the hour of day? So we removed the Markovian transition on the switches, and we proposed this uh, RSLDS model. And uh, from, from now on, I just say LDS if I'm referring to the smaller parts of the model. So I don't, I don't want to confuse you with too much terminologies, but this is the actual model we have used in the work. So if you think about this kind of model, right, uh, uh, the, here I can clearly see the um, statistical uh, you know, method for capturing the data and also putting some hidden variables. Right, 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 right. Um, have you seen the work uh, or have you thought about um, superimposing this with, um, let's say, um, past behavior? So this is something I'm looking at right now, the data I collected today on this list. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, of course, are doing the things of normalcy. Right. Can I, can I right. do it as saying I have, um, uh, through the, after having done, build the model, right. can right. I uh, see that in the same form? So I have kind of, you know, a series of snapshots uh, yeah. over the period of time. Right, right, right. And yeah. then... I can much more easily capture for mm -hmm. a particular, you know, whichever way you want to view it. Like right. You create a view of database. Similarly, you can create a view of these, right. you know, uh, things. And Superimposing so, yeah, different time series models. Time series model. And then right. you can say, well, which of these things is most, devi you know, deviating the most. Right. Right. And then correspondingly bring in the relevant knowledge because you know that this relates to this particular location. Yeah. Well, what is yeah. at that location? Right. And what right. is reported find eleven dot org and now I can say potential explanation. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, that at find org A there is a arena uh, nearby and B there was a schedule event at that uh, Yeah. Recent. So the two things you mentioned, mm -hmm. one is looking at historical data and mm -hmm. coming up with this model and then superimposing. That's I'll be describing that and that's exactly what we did. We did that in a mathematical way, but exactly what you did. So we take historical data, mm. superimpose the newer observations and see okay, for us. Can I see, can I, can I think of those, you know, uh, anomaly uh, detection things, the hourly, you know, processing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in s this form? Yeah, yeah, so that's, yeah. That's what mathematically it is. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's just that there is a number that captures no, it. That, yeah. Beyond that, though, it's not just that. Can I see correlating this with the background and historical knowledge. So let me talk about background knowledge even here. Mm. So this is a RSLDS model, which is switching behavior. Mm. How did I even know that there is a switching behavior? That's the first part of knowledge, Dr. Like, I know that there is 
I looked at the data, I figured out that there is day of week, hour of day, which really influences the switching behavior. That's how I even have these switch switching variables. You don't, the point is that you don't should be, you, you shouldn't be involved in that if the uh, background, you know, background knowledge is there for you to be, a, you know, for the system to apply and automatically ask the question, what could explain this? Yeah, yeah. So I shouldn't be involved in uh, specifying the model or ex or deriving the explanation. Deriving the explanation. Yeah, yeah. That we are not involved. Okay. So it is correlating these two things using location and time knowledge. Um, I'll talk about how do I do that in the next few slides. But all I wanted to say is that there is domain knowledge even here. Specifying the model itself is based on some knowledge. The later on part where we put these two things together also has domain knowledge, which I'll talk about in the next few slides. So we have considered uh, various uh, models to come up with this uh, specification of LDS for solving our problem. And uh, we found that there are two desired features that we want. One is we should be able to differentiate between different dynamics. Like you saw that there was increasing, decreasing, and steady state, right? So how do you differentiate between these different dynamics? And uh, we, we considered using like Gaussian mixture model, which is a good model for modeling mixture of distributions. And that re didn't really capture what we want. So we also want to account for unobserved va uh, variables. And we don't know there are so many things that are really hidden. and uh, very very popular time series models like autoregressive and ARIMA models, they don't account for unobserved variables. So we have this linear dynamical system which captures what we want in terms of hidden variables. And it also has a stochasticity within it using that matrix you saw. You have this transition matrix and observation matrix. So that captures the stochasticity. So now let me just describe uh, context specific, uh, how did I learn these models, LDS models. So one year worth of data. So we put it in the, uh, so we indexed it based on day of week and hour of day. And after that, we used to find typical dynamics. And what is typical dynamics here? I spoke about mean and medoid, right? So for every day of week and hour of day, I find the mean and medoid, and I use that information to learn the LDS models. For every link in the road network, I have 168 LDS models. Why? Because seven days in a week and 24 hours in a day, right? So I have 168 per link, and there are over 2,500 links for which we have data, and it's around 400,000 models. So that's why it's called a context-specific model. So later on, we use this in a context-specific way. For us, what do we mean by context is loca uh, location, which is the link, and we have day of week and hour of day. So that's the context we're talking about. So now that we have described this mathematical model, which captures typical variations, how do we define normalcy? So we need to come up with some metric, right? So Dr. Sheth mentioned about these variations between different curves. So you can probably plot all the curves and look at those curves that are really deviating. But I'll talk about the data set size. It's like 1.4 billion data points. So manually doing it is probably not an option. So one way is to come up with the metric of what is normalcy. So we use something called the log likelihood score. So log likelihood of a data point is that how likely that data point is generated from a distribution. So the closer, the lower the log likelihood score, it's not good. If the log likelihood score is higher, then it's closer to the distribution. So we compute the log likelihood score for every day of week, for every hour of day, in the entire year, and we group them to compute this kind of dis uh, box plot here. So the log likelihood scores are the ones that are taken to plot this uh, graph here. Um, in descriptive statistics, box plot gives you a way to characterize outliers. And all we want to do here is to characterize those log, li log likelihood scores that are outliers. And I'll talk about how this is being used uh, in the next uh, step. Now that we have the model, now that we have computed the log uh, likelihood scores. Uh, now let's see how we can tag anomalies in sensor data. So the first step on slide 40 is that there is input data. And if it's just the training phase, I use the LDS model I computed in the first step. I, I, I give out the hour of day and day of week and get the appropriate LDS model. And I compute the log likelihood score. So this is what is the log likelihood score computation. Now. Let's use this log likelihood score to tag anomalies. How do I do that? There is input data. Then I have, 
I have indexed it based on day of week and hour of day. So then I take this day of week, hour of day, plug it into this log likelihood matrix and I get the appropriate log likelihood score. And then I compare it with the log likelihood score of the current day of week and hour of day. Then I tag those anomalies here. So this step tags all the anomalies. So next, now that we have described this, let's look at how do we put things together. So now, I, now we have events from textual streams, which we have extracted from Twitter. We have also events from 511.org, which are, both of them are textual events. Then we have sensor data that we are getting from 511.org. And now we'll uh, see, and we have also tagged anomalies in sensor data. Now we'll see how these two things can be put together. We use, we use, the, we use the knowledge of locations and time to put these things together. So there are events that we have extracted and there is an anomaly. For every event, we see if that really manifests as an anomaly. So we can't be sure if all events really manifest as anomalies. So we use the location information and time to tie these two things together. So that's how we put uh, both textual events and sensor data anomalies together. So we have found that there's a lot of missing data, which I'll talk in the evaluation part of the. But clearly, this, for example, 0.5 kilometer radius, that will depend, for example, on things like density. Suppose I am Absolutely, yeah. Rural area, I'll take longer, you know, you know, bigger area. If it's a dense area, I'll take smaller, thing, right? Right, right. And also, this is done in the San Francisco Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Again, there is variation in the link distribution. Mm -hmm. So for example, center of the city may have a lot more links. Mm. As you go away from the city, there are a lot lesser links. Mm. So in that case, you may have to vary the radius. Mm. Uh, we chose 0.5 because we were just focusing on the center part of the city. And uh, if I increase more, then there are a lot more links and it's just there, it's too much. Mm. Yeah. So after we put these two things together, let's uh, uh, just look at some of the evaluation issues that we faced. Uh, we have collected data for over a year now, and uh, it's been co collect collected continuously. Uh, 511.org has a streaming uh, Java messaging service, so you could constantly collect data. So we have over 1.4 uh, billion speed and travel time observations that we have collected, and we have to analyze it for building our models. We have over 1,600 events that were reported from 511. And we saw that in the extraction step, we extracted around 39,000 uh, events from 20 million tweets. Learning normalcy models is uh, pretty hard. Actually, it's linear in the number of time points you have and uh, the number of iterations you really take to learn the parameters. I didn't go into those details, but this is a time-consuming process. And it, it, if at all I use my laptop, it would take like two months to run all these uh, learning process that I just described to you. So we had to come up with a scalable uh, implementation of this. And the scalable implementation takes around 24 hours for all the links in the road network. So this is for, uh, if I had to process all the data, it takes two months versus 24 hours. So now let's look at some uh, evaluation. And uh, here I just want to point out some of the challenges you face when you're using uh, real world data sets. And uh, some of the issues like missing data becomes a lot more prominent. Uh, the, in this evaluation, we want to evaluate. Now that I have these textual events from textual uh, streams, how many of them really manifested as anomalies in sensor data? Conversely, how many anomalies I could explain in the sensor data using the textual events? So that's the goal of this evaluation. OK, let me go step by step because it's loaded. So here, what it means is that out of 511.org events, 33% of those events had all the data in the link. So given the event location, I know that what are the links surrounding that event. So there might be, let's say, 10 links surrounding that event. So even if there is missing data for one link, I tag it as missing, because I'm not sure whether I can really claim anything for missing data. So for 33% of the events, we found complete data in all the links around them. And for Twitter, you can see only 2% we found that there were links around that which had complete data. The reason is 511.org focuses on center of the city, and they actually give out more events in that location where there are links which monitor uh, speed of vehicles. Whereas Twitter, events are not limited to the center of the city. People report about events around the city. And there are there is no infrastructure for us to get sensor data for those locations. Among them, another th important, interesting thing to notice here 
is that within 511.org, 70% of them manifested as anomalies. Whereas in Twitter, 97% of them manifested as anomalies. Any guess? The reason is 511.org is bound to report all possible events. Whether it's impacting the traffic or not, they just report it. Whereas people report events when they're really bothered about it. And that's why you see that there is higher level of manifestation in, uh, in case of Twitter. And on slide 44, the other interesting conclusion we found that was there were these long-term events, for example, long-term road construction, which is already par part of my normalcy model. Because I have one year worth of data, if the long-term construction is extending for months, it's already part of the uh, normalcy model. right? So in that case, the ones that are not in uh, bold are the ones for which we did not find anomalies. So you can see that there are long-term events for which we did not find anomalies. There are short-term events like accidents, for example. We can most likely find that there is an anomaly in sensor data. So this is one of the uh, interesting observations uh, we found. Finally, to conclude this part, uh, <coughs> we have examined the theoretical nature of what sensor data looks like and what kind of models uh, we can choose. And we, we actually did a very systematic approach to choose a model. Uh, then we were able to use declarative knowledge of the domain to use a piecewise linear approximation of this nonlinear dynamics. And this was a, a key thing for specifying our model. And without this, we couldn't have captured the normalcy model, for example. And we also spoke about how do we come up with this metric of abnorm abnormality. And we were able to tag abnormalities in sensor data. And we evaluated our approach on a real world data set. And finally, the last part, I'll just summarize uh, given. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so when you say the long term event, was not treated as anomaly most of the time. Uh, but when a long term event transition happens, so the event starts, uh, probably then you might have observed some anomaly. So did you see something like that? So the way I evaluate, so I didn't go into the details, but the way I compartmentalize the data, the minimum I can go is an R. I have only 60 data points for an R. I can't zoom in beyond that. However, if I have more data points for an R, probably I can do what you're saying. So I can go into the details and check if there is a transition. Said that, uh, I mean, I think that it's possible for us to look at that. So. If the event is happening, if the event really happens at the border of two hours, then you can probably see if there is a transition in that phase. Yeah, but it just depends on the uh, data we have, I guess. So the last part of my dissertation uh, talks about representation of actions. Here I'm just going to summarize. And I'm not going to go into details uh, given the time constraints. Uh, so this is the work I did at Bosch uh, under the mentorship of uh, Corey. Uh, I, I've, there I contributed to the problem of representing tasks in IOTS environment. So the idea is that there are tasks, do-it-yourself tasks, that people are interested in doing. And you want to recommend tasks to them. And you want to do so in a robust way. That is, if they fail at a particular task, you want to account for that. You also want to account for resources in the environment. So there are all these various things that you want to account for. And how do you formalize this problem? And that's the overall idea of this work. The first part is, how do you represent tasks? And we use semantic web representation languages uh, to represent tasks. And the second part was, uh, uh, I was uh, tasked to develop these rec uh, recommendation algorithms. Like, how do I recommend best possible task? What is the notion of optimality in re task recommendation? So I use something called Markov decision process. And now that AlphaGo uh, with AlphaGo, it is becoming popular. It's the reinforcement learning part of it. So Markov decision process is one of the reinforcement learning frameworks. Um, and in the evaluation uh, part, um, uh, I devised an uh, environment where you could do stochastic simulations. So you can specify the environment in such a way that there is transition between different states in the environment. And there are also effect of actions on the environment. So I use something called. Uh, uh, RDDL simulator uh, for evaluating the last part. Uh, the, so the, that's the this work. So now revisiting my uh, thesis uh, statement, slide 48. Uh, we did find that uh, declarative knowledge helps uh, for annotation, for example. And uh, we were able to use declarative knowledge in probabilistic models to do better annotation. 
and that resulted the event extraction resulted in uh, complementary corroborative and timely information the second part uh, we were able to use these events that we extracted from textual data to explain anomalies in sensor data and we were able to build these context specific models that were applied in a context specific way during our testing phase to tag these uh, anomalies and also correlate it with uh, textual events and the last part is uh, uh, using declarative knowledge of actions we were able to create a markov decision process uh, which has some parameters to be specified so we used knowledge of the domain to specify these parameters and uh, those are the three pieces of my thesis and uh, that's how these things relate to each other So here are my overall conclusions. So we found that uh, there are TCS uh, systems are very complex. There are multimodal events. If you have to understand these events in the real world, you have to really process these observations from multiple modalities. And we also found that observations from people can provide complementary, corroborative, and timely information. And throughout my dissertation, I utilized uh, declarative knowledge with probabilistic graphical models, uh, specifically uh, we looked at uh, uh, annotation of uh, uh, text. So we looked at de using declarative knowledge to create sequence labeling models for annotation. And we also found that knowledge of the domain helps us to specify these uh, piecewise linear approximations that are required to model nonlinear dynamics. And uh, that was the key aspect in modeling these nonlinear uh, dynamics in our case. Uh, I've also looked at uh, Bayesian network structure refinement using knowledge of concept net. And I've also looked at uh, representation of tasks and how do you transform this problem of tasks and goals into a Markov decision process problem. So this is a high level view of uh, my dissertation. So I spoke about uh, three key things. One is probabilistic graphical models. I spoke about declarative knowledge and there is data in the domain. So this is how all these things come together. So the three parts of my dissertation which is PCS event e extraction, understanding, and recommendation is grounded in probabilistic graphical models. I implement all of them in probabilistic graphical models. However, PGMs utilize declarative knowledge. So you could, uh, we found that PGMs uh, had, uh, we, we showed that PGMs has two parts, right? One is structure, the other one is parameters. So we were able to use declarative knowledge to uh, come up with the structure. We were able to use declarative knowledge to even come up with parameters. And we were able to use data alone to come up with PGM models. That's one way of really characterizing or learning parameters for a PGF, PGM. Or PGM. <coughs> and then we use declarative knowledge to annotate data and then use that enriched data for learning parameters uh, for PGM model. Throughout my stay, I worked on multiple projects. Um, this is one of the projects that's really close to my heart. Um, so I worked on uh, K-Health project, uh, which was a a uh, great experience, um, and Dr. Forbes uh, was the key in helping us design this kit and coming up with use cases and things like that. Um, finally, my stay here at PhD, sorry, my PhD was very fruitful. Uh, I was fortunate to have a lot of uh, mentors and uh, uh, special thanks to my advisors who really took a lot of interest to um, complete this journey. Here are some publications. Uh, I would like to thank uh, my advisors, Professor Amit Shet and uh, Professor D.K. Prasad. Uh, I, I, I appreciate their patience and uh, all the discussions we had, all the productive. Not of patience. <laughs> 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 you could be patient if you want to stay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, special thanks to uh, 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 Corey Henson, who's able to join here uh, physically. Uh, and uh, special thanks to Payam, uh, who let me explore my own ways when I was in UK. I think that's my best part of my uh, PhD. I spent uh, time uh, kind of uh, focused on my work. Um, and special thanks to uh, Biplav. Uh, he was my first uh, uh, mentor in a research lab. So it was a very nice experience. I remember the walks we took and all the tea breaks we took and discussed about various ideas. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Forbes. Uh, for a wonderful uh, project experience that we had uh, with her and a wonderful collaboration. And a special thanks to Shojun Wong, who's uh, joining us from China, even though he's just reached there, probably. Um, yeah, finally, I would like to thank everyone here. Uh, each of you have been uh, great uh, 
friend and great mentor in many ways. Uh, special thanks to KHL team. Uh, uh, basically, I want to thank all the uh, all my friends and thanks a lot again. And I would be happy to take questions. Uh, hello? Yeah, we hear you. Oh, OK. So, um, so the verdict is that uh, the people who are participating uh, remotely gets the first uh, uh, chance to ask questions. So please go ahead uh, if, you, if you guys have any questions. I'll go last. I have a list of questions. I'll go last. Yeah, OK, I'll go one by one, maybe. Uh, Biplav, uh, do you have any questions? Yeah, hi, Prabhu. Hi, Biplav. Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, uh, an excellent presentation. And uh, I, I, I shared some questions uh, after going through your AAA paper, OK? Yeah, OK. Uh, by email long time back. Right, right, so, right. Yeah. Maybe just uh, consider them, okay? And one of the things which I was just wondering was uh, uh, the models that you were learning for uh, from five and one. Uh, how often do you imagine you would want to relearn them? So you have <coughs> so so for example, you were considering one year data, right, from the sensors. That's right. Yeah. Okay. And. Uh, the one which you are getting from Twitter, right? Uh, that's uh, almost real time and so on. So right. Whatever uh, is the baseline uh, model for the different uh, road segments, okay, right? You are learning. Uh, how how stable are these uh, models, and how frequently do you imagine we will have to redo it? Redo it. So uh, that's a. Uh, um that's a critical question uh, to ask, um, especially if we want to have this system set up in real time, right? Uh, even even like considering that as a uh, conceptual question, I think that it is uh, uh, the, the 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 normalcy models we learn is for the entire year, uh, but I don't see that it's it's going to change very quickly. However, the normalcy models that I have learned by itself may have some impurities in it, if I can call that so. The reason is uh, there are various events uh, that are still surrounding the link, and I don't really have access to that. So we may have to consider if we can really separate out these things. That is, if there is data from these links, and uh, there are absolutely no events for sure. So in that case, uh, we could probably learn normalcy models and reuse them later. Um, uh, that that's one uh, thought that comes to my mind. Um, in terms of uh, now, the current state is that I have these models that I've learned for a year. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, it can be a baseline to start with, and then you can uh, uh, look at newer data points that are coming in and uh, tag anomalies in real time without learning the models every time. Uh, so, the, so, so to answer your question, I think there are two things. Yeah, one how pure the data is without any events. If we can get that kind of data, which is very hard to come by in this domain, you might know that it's hard to get ground truth data here. In fact, uh, we had, I remember the uh, project we did uh, using uh, event extraction in SMS messages. Again, we had this issue of verifiability. I mean, <laughs> if there is an event that I extract, how do I know for sure if there is an event? Maybe in that case, there were cops reporting events. And maybe here, there is 511. Uh, data which is reporting incidents, which we can be sure of. So maybe just if we make that assumption that 511 reports all the all possible events, I think we can learn a normalcy model considering only those data points where there were no events. And maybe reuse that. Maybe, maybe let me take a stand. Yeah. So, so maybe here are a uh, couple of things that you can use to even further cut your model. So for example, you can say seasonal models. So for winter, I learn one, and then monsoon season, I learn another one. Right. And then right. summer right. and spring, I <coughs> learn the third one. Right. Or uh, you right. can separate out for uh, long-term construction. So mm -hmm. suddenly new uh, roads have come up, or 
say one way street has become two way or something of that sort, then you right, can right. your model. Right, right. So in that case, my normalcy model is indexed by not only just day of week, hour of day, yeah, but, but I have these it. additional uh, variables that I can account for to learn these normalcy models. Yeah. Can you add me to Skype? Yeah, thanks, Biplav. I'll be looking at uh, the questions you sent. Thanks, Pramod. Yeah, welcome. So, um, yeah, if you can help me, I can ask the question. So they can, they can hear. Hey, they can hear anyway. Oh, they can? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so, so Viplo, um, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, during the uh, effort, uh, you know, with uh, Delhi uh, traffic, uh, you know, data sparsity was a big issue. And um, just with the analogy of, um, uh, you know, People in machine learning, uh, you know, understanding now increasingly that use of background knowledge can reduce the need for training data set. Uh, that kind of analogy, uh, you know, do you see more and more knowledge available even where the data collection is sparse? And um, could you, can mm -hmm. you think of, uh, for example, that Delhi traffic issue being handled uh, once, once again with more um, this background knowledge and uh, make it more solvable? Okay, so uh, what? Uh, so lately, for the last year and a half, I've been working with water data. Yeah, okay. very exciting. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and uh, the issues are similar. But uh, uh, so, so what is happening is, uh, uh, so for example, crowdsourced data, right, which is really qualitative in nature. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this could be people reporting, just like uh, what we had in uh, Twitter, right? Yeah. So similarly, uh, people reporting uh, various information. Uh, um, uh, through apps and uh, many other means. Okay, <coughs> so that is there, and it can be. So what happens is, uh, either people are reporting it uh, for the most prominent areas a lot. So there's a lot of data scarcity. So there are right. areas where uh, there's a lot of information, and there are others where uh, uh, you know people would not report uh, for a long time until there is an accident. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Right. So so that kind of phenomenon is happening for. Uh, People contribute to data. Now, in terms of the sensors, okay, the, which we, uh, we may have deployed, uh, they actually are uh, again giving you a sample of uh, what the city has. So, for example, you may have buses, right, for which you have GPS data, mm -hmm. or you can right. have taxis, but or, or autos. But the thing is, they would be only for areas which they frequent. Right, the bus routes mm. or uh, these uh, uh, taxis, they go more to the airports and the railway stations. Right, 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 okay. right. So it is a similar kind of thing. So my question when I asked, right, it was more about, uh, so if you build traffic systems and water systems, they are usually for 20 years, 30 years, those kind of things, right? Mm -hmm. So any of these models that we learn, there has to be a mechanism through which it is uh, self-adapting over time. Right. Right, right, we, right. We can't be sending a PhD out there to be recalibrating everything. Right, right, right. Absolutely, so yeah. It was in that spirit. Yeah. I was thinking that perhaps there could be a, I mean, uh, in the follow up work or whatever, right, on model stability. Right, right. Absolutely. And one of the good thing about LDS model is that it's adaptive. That is, if you want to change the parameters later, you could keep using a normalcy model that you have learned. But later on, if you think that you have to change uh, the parameters or you have to learn parameters, uh, you could learn new parameters. But still, um, I think that the critical question you asked was when? When do you want to retrain the model? I think uh, that requires us to think about normalcy in general and then compare what we think is normal with the model that is already learned and see how the distance between these two predictions. and then. Uh, when the when the predictions goes wrong, that's when probably you have to learn new parameters. Right, and and uh, the comment earlier made uh, about doing it by season yeah. is uh, perhaps one of the ways. And uh, this is not uh, very different from in traffic. We know that there is a peak and off peak behavior of roads, and that there's a peak right. and a peak day. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So traffic domain was uh, simpler to handle because there are some known uh, 
knowledge that we have about the domain. But with water, I think it might be even more challenging. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks, Biplo. Uh, Dr. Wong, do you have any questions? Uh, yes. When you talk about uh, CRM, what kind of feature are you using? The features I use, uh, the CRF model I use, is just a linear chain CRF model. So you mean the neighbors? Yes. Between the tags. Okay. The event tags, right? Yeah, tags, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so do you have any other questions? Okay, guys from here, uh, before then Payam. Payam, yeah, Payam has, and then Dr. Fobis, I guess. Uh, promote one suggestion. I, I think they uh, it's good for like when the discussion you have with people and answering that question. It's good if you start adding those to your future work. I think that that is a good discussion. Okay. A very interesting point. Yeah. Okay. And the question also Dr. Wang asked, I think it's good just to add a sentence to clarify in your CRF model. Right, right, right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, in my presentation, yeah. In my dissertation, I have mentioned that in the document. Okay, if you have it, uh, I missed that. But I think the, the, the point you, you discussed with Big Club, I think it's a very good uh, point. Stability yeah. Stability of the model. And okay. And go to your future work. Okay, perfect. I'll do that, yeah. Okay. My question is, yeah, you're using lots of social media data. Can you just briefly discuss what is the problem? What are the potential problems? If you are talking about the advantages and pros of using social data, what mm -hmm. are the disadvantages? So one of the challenges is that uh, social data is messy, right? I mean, there are multiple challenges, actually. And uh, one of them is that it's very messy. Uh, in fact, uh, when we were trying to extract tuples uh, from for these events, you might remember that we had multiple reports of the same event by different people. So now the question is, how are you going to decide what is the event based on multiple reports of the same event? Because they might be reporting at different times, right? I mean, there might be some delay in their reporting. There might be reporting 10 minutes after the accident or 20 minutes after the accident. So the question is, how can you really look at this data and really come up with a summarization of that event uh, for multiple reports. And there might be redundancy in that. So dealing with redundancy was a big challenge. Uh, that's definitely a problem when we were using uh, social media data. And uh, in fact, the other problem is that uh, it's, uh, it's very noisy. So uh, for example, uh, people might say, accidentally, I spilled coffee. And I shouldn't be tagging accident as a accident that's happening on the road. So those are the challenges because of the short nature of uh, text I use specifically, I guess. Um, that's one of, that's the second challenge I can think of. And, um, Do you think it can, it can be biased? It can be also, there could be trust issues? Absolutely. So biased in the sense that uh, you saw in the evaluation, uh, we found that Twitter events probably manifested the most. What does that mean? So that means that probably we know about those events that really bothered people, but there are events that probably didn't bother people, but still it might be a serious issue. So we don't know about those things. So yeah, I think, then, yeah. And can we say there could be a social phenomenon in using social data because <laughs> there are certain groups of people using social media? Right, yeah, yeah, I, I, I get, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay, my suggestion will be, it would be good if you add a brief discussion to the chapter you talk about how you have collected your data. Okay. And talk a little bit of the problems. And okay. This is a recommendation. You don't have to, but my suggestion would be also add a section to your conclusion mm -hmm. about lessons learned. Okay. And tell what you learned actually working with social data, because this would be very helpful in future for other PhD students to read your thesis and see what you learned out of it. 
Right, right, right. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. My next question would be short and quick. If you want to change the domain, you're using in traffic domain your social media analysis. If you want to extend it to other domains, what changes do you need to do to make your model? Uh, the key key thing uh, in our model is that we have knowledge of the domain. Uh, for example, we had OpenStreetMaps, which had location information. We had 511.org, which had event-related information. So because of that, we were able to create this environment where we were able to automatically generate training data uh, and do so in a high-quality uh, way, and then train the CRF model using that. So if you are changing the domain, the question is, uh, in that case, do we have such data in that domain? So maybe we could reuse it. Uh, if we if we cannot reuse it, it's a lot of manual effort to really create uh, new knowledge about the domain and then use that for uh, creating training data set for a sequence labeling model. So if, if we are changing the domain, because we are reliant on the declarative knowledge of traffic, it may not be straightforward. That is, I can't use the models that I have trained now, that is the CRF model for annotating traffic events, directly on a different task. So I have to look at what is the knowledge that's available for that domain, and probably utilize that knowledge to create the training data, and then build new CRF model. From there, we could use that CRF model for a new domain. Uh, we were also considering to uh, kind of, I mean, this is traffic uh, information in a city, right? But there are various other city-related events. Uh, for example, uh, there are reports of uh, uh, street cleaning and sidewalk problems on 311.org. So we were wondering if we could use that information to uh, create automatically these training data sets to train CRF model. So with city events, I see that there are promising uh, avenues. Like you could reuse some existing knowledge to create these models. But if you completely change the domain, let's say you move to healthcare, so then obviously you can't, we can't reuse the CRF models we have. Uh, but definitely having declarative knowledge uh, would ease the process of training and also uh, cre uh, in the creation of better sequence labeling models. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, uh, any other? Yeah. Any other committee members have any questions? Like Dr. Phobes? Uh, as I, I uh, suggested in my it's better to have a discussion about deep learning because oh, yes. any yeah. time I think you are using machine learning technique in any part of your places, and I'm sure there's a deep learning approach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm going to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I received. Yes, Dr. Wang, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah, I received your uh, suggestion. I will be putting it in the future work. Okay. No, you know. And also, uh, so I look at the slides that you have uh, presented. Uh, I remember your proposal is, uh, is more ambitious than what you, uh, you finish your thesis. Sorry? Uh, for the recommendation part, the, the last part. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your right. Your proposal, you propose a lot of work using uh, training for learning techniques, but in your thesis, you only have a small part. Yeah, uh, in my proposal, in my proposal, I summarized what I did in the mark out decision process part of it, that is, in the action recommendation part of it. I did not promise anything new in that part. What I promised was that I'll be working on the understanding aspect of the problem. So mostly whatever I did for action recommendation is tied with Bosch, and it's tied to their project. So it's basically creating that infrastructure where it was already done during uh, my proposal defense, where I have this infrastructure to uh, deal with task recommendation, in that I have this representation of tasks which use semantic web languages then i have yeah then i have recommendation uh, algorithm which is the markov decision process and then i have a stochastic simulation engine so it was already done 
uh, for my proposal. Okay, I see. I see. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. Um, you have to ask. Go ahead. Oh, just a second. Dr. Forbes, do you have any questions? Uh, just a quick one, and I think probably I have this question since I, the computer science um, stuff is different for me. But have you seen that this work you've done with this modeling has at all informed uh, the work we've done with the asthma app, or are they two different? Um, so uh, there is a connection point, uh, actually. So I spoke about action recommendation during my proposal defense. And that uses something called the Markov decision process, which is basically recommending actions and the, de the definition of what is an optimal action. So the definition of optimal action is based on the cost matrix, which is defined using uh, some parameters. And there is also rewards. And there is also this state transition. So you could take the exact Markov decision process problem and apply it to asthma, where there are various actions that you recommend to the patient. And the reward is that whether there was an asthma attack or not. So not having an asthma attack is a reward. So you could model that problem using this reinforcement learning kind of paradigm. So I see a parallel, and I have added this in, the, in my dissertation. So definitely, there is a connection between these two. And I find that uh, it, the asthma problem is a great place to apply these ideas. We will have a lot more um, variety of data in asthma. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, uh, and also less declarative knowledge. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know about that. Because uh, knowledge is there. But uh, the, we, we spoke about contextualization, personalization, Dr. Shed. It's very hard to deal with. The personalization part would be very hard, but yeah, uh, contextualization. Probably hard. Suppose I mind literature and uh, I get it um, uh, curated or validated by domain expert. Uh, I would, I could have. A oh yeah, yeah. Uh, that ontology is also there. Right. Uh, but the issue would be that, like um, in the travel, he could observe the data uh, every minute or whatever time that uh, you know uh, uh, speed is reported for a year. Uh, for um, asthma, our project will be limited to uh, data points from 200 patients. And some of them will be for, you know, uh, complete data set, others may not be complete data set either. So uh, how do we um, deal with more diversity, uh, which is both good and bad. Uh, you know, it is good in, in that there will be more corroborative information, and yet uh, uh, learning how to match them could be harder with lesser data. And the corresponding model will be more complex, perhaps, in some sense. I mean, human body probably is a lot more complex than uh, traffic, at least the level at which you model traffic. So um, uh, so I think it will be challenging. Uh, we'll just have to uh, try and see. We have a lot of knowledge, a lot of assumptions, a lot of heuristics. Uh, and then we can say, yeah. ah, with all these things, we have been able to reasonably predict um, uh, in all, onset of asthma, if the drug was not taken, if the drug was taken, abutra was taken, asthma did not occur, ah, it was a success case, perhaps. But so, you know, uh, and, and the evaluation can't be based on actual things occurring on the ground. We can't let asthma attack occur on the patients, kind of thing. So, so those will be number of challenges there. Yeah, and, and good thing about asthma is that there are uh, recommended actions for each state of the patient. So at least that part is clear. What might be challenging is the connecting that action to what is really happening with the patient. So you may not have complete information in that regard. So uh, it, it, it may be challenging to do that part, the mapping part. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Have you had a question? Are you thinking for order of events? I didn't, uh, I didn't get why you use CRF actually. So, one of the. Oh, yeah. So, the question is uh, uh, CRF, what is the motivation for using a CRF model? 
instead of what instead of some other model no no you were seeking i mean the sequence of event was the critical part that you were seeking in the, the sequence of events uh, what is the sequence that you want to learn so oh okay okay so um the sequence is nothing but a set of words in a sentence so tweet is a set of uh, words right so there are tokens in a tweet and i want to label each token with a tag and tag is my labeling part of it what i want to learn is how, given a tweet which has tokens how do i assign tags for each token that is what is the learning problem i have and crf provides uh, it's it's state of the art for sequence labeling and it provides you a way to capture long distance uh, dependencies and then you could label each token with a tag so i mean uh, uh, you can also do this task with uh, multi label spn also okay so you can consider each label as a multi level classification rather than just considering sequence and uh, looking for why actually this is for sequence labeling yeah? yes so for on learning the tags mm -hmm. i think another approach might be the multi level classification and using normal classifier such as sp yeah you have to do again uh, you need to In make sure example of half half moon bay brewing company and what are challenges are in this one yeah actually his qu question i think uh, is uh, fundamental in terms of um, why crf versus something else right but one the example of half moon be doing company help you explain it and actually i have to answer that question uh, based on a very i think different approach but i'll just bring up that example so that i can demonstrate it hey someone else i'm hearing a echo no no he is not uh so to answer your question uh, crf models uh, it's a discriminative model so it captures the conditional distributions right so in that case uh, you are not learning the entire distribution of tags what you are learning is given a word what is the most likely tag for that and you do so considering the tag dependencies so if you can capture tag dependencies using that svm approach you could do it but i don't think that captures dependencies between tags because it just considers a word sequential dependencies exactly yeah sequential dependencies with the tag and then you classify each word with a tag if you can capture sequential dependencies you can try it out and maybe we can compare but but you get the idea right so yeah actually my concern is i didn't see any sequence when you want to consider the whole text here so this is what dr shet was referring to so this is a tweet and this is annotated using these tags this is called a bio notation each word is used uh, uh, each tag is used to uh, uh, is associated with each word so you can see that there is half moon bay brewing right so that's a that's a company name or it's a location in san francisco so the actually the one i think the root of your question is why sequence labeling for uh, for detecting locations or events so one of the key reason is that there are locations with multiple words so you don't want to just look at one word and decide if it's a location and similarly for events there are multiple words so you have to capture this uh, sequence so generally it is like name entity recognition task yes absolutely absolutely and uh, you don't actually uh, get any dependency tags you treat i mean you don't actually take into account dependency tags for there is a dependency i i consider the tag dependencies oh okay so a, a linear chain here of model captures only adjacent tag dependencies okay. so this is a potential that captures so the current tag depends on the previous tag however the normalization you do is a global normalization so you have captured the entire sentence yeah the question uh, you mentioned about the hash grid right and then geohash yeah 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 how how do you uh, do you generalize everything that happens in that grid 
Actually, I completely skipped over that because of time. So there is an algorithm that we have published in the journal paper which talks about how do you go from annotated tweets to the tuple. So there are three steps in that. So first, you create the annotated tweets. You create the geo hash for the entire city. You group the tweets based on the geo hash number. So when you say when you create geo hash, each grid in the city is associated with a number. So you group now that you have tweets with locations spread across the city, you group the tweets based on the location. For each tweet, associate a type based on 511 hierarchy that I was talking about. After that, pick the majority type and then derive all the metadata. For example, start location, end location. And uh, there is also impact. For example, how many people spoke about it can be one indicator of that. So yeah, I, I take grids to kind of uh, summarize what's happening within the grid. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so you're trying to understand these different events using multimodal data. Mm -hmm. I, well, I guess you mean text and sensor data. Yes, um, that's right. Similar to Pyam, I kind of want to sep I separate these and isolate the problems. So, but rather than kind of isolating the textual problem, mm -hmm. I isolate the sensor problem. So it seems sensor data subsumes a lot of different types of information. Absolutely, so right. Sensor right. And integrating and understanding these is a problem in itself. Yes. Absolutely, yeah. I'm curious, how does that change your approach if you forget about text for a minute and just focus on the, the sensor data? Just sensor data part of it? Mm hmm Okay. So in that case, uh, can I get an annotated uh, time series data? That's the question. So. I could forget about all the information I get from textual events. I have sensor data alone, which is sensor data time series that's being collected uh, from a location, let's say. And the, que the question is, um, can I get labels for each part of the time series data so that later on, uh, I could use those labels uh, as a way to learn dynamics for each of those labels. For example, for a sporting event might have two dips, and I need to learn that entire dynamics. And if I have a label of sporting events for that sensor data, then I could learn probably using multiple linear models again. But uh, I, I could use the label to learn the dynamics. And then similarly, let's say there is an accident, there is one dip. Then I, I can associate the accident label with that dynamics. So there is some way that we need to provide information uh, there might be ways of learning normalcy without that label. So that's one of the advantages of no anomaly detection approach we used, where we did not really say what is an anomaly. In fact, that's one of the major challenges in anomaly detection systems. They cannot come up with a definition of what's an anomaly. All they have is a lot of data, and they want to see those points that deviate. So that part is completely uh, learned from data. So maybe if we want to learn anomaly detection techniques, we could use unlabeled data, and we don't need any textual data, that's fine. So we could use these models to learn that. Uh, all, all we have is textual data as a, as you said, we're interpreting the sensor data, and it's kind of complementary and qualitative, as Biplo mentioned, to kind of associate yes, the labels. this framework where you divide these different relationships. Yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned timely. We yeah. also have collaborative and corroborative. Yeah, corroborative, so yeah. Complementary. So sensor data could also have these same relationships. Absolutely. I suppose. Yes. Okay. Yes. And I'm guessing you get those also from some background knowledge, some domain knowledge. Right. Um, so when you say sensor data has that relationship, for example, let's say I find an accident in textual data, uh, then if it's there's a dip in speed, right? It's kind of supporting my case that there is an accident. So it's already complementary to that, in that way, I guess. So is that what you refer to as? I'm wondering what you think about it. <laughs> it is complementary because it's a different modality. However, I should be sure that that's the same event that's causing it. So maybe location and time aspect would play an important role. So if there is an accident reported at 9 AM in the morning, then there is a dip around that time. You could still make that connection. You could also look at multiple instances of accidents over time and see how these two things correlate and come up with 
a model. So that's definitely a complementary thing because it's already a different modality, I guess. Okay, so we have timely that that affects yeah. so let collaborative. Me, yeah, maybe let me take a stab at uh, your question. So, so essentially, you're saying ignore uh, text. Completely. Yeah, the, yeah, that's and the thing. Uh, look at sensor data. So let's consider uh, time to travel a link and average speed, and then you can try to correlate them. And and if the oh, road yeah. is uh, running full capacity, then maybe the delay and the speed will be correlated. If the road is not running full capacity, then maybe it's on the whim of the driver, and so then you won't see correlation. So so you could find the uh, correlation between different streams of uh, sensor value. And that might relate to this unknown factor about uh, the occupancy of the of the road and if you have that information then you can further explain why those are connected right yeah I, I'm really interested in kind of the, the, how the relationships work so timely seems obvious um, corroborative what, wait, what is it? which is the, the so the corroborative, corroborative is you talk. so corroborative is more kind of like a repetition similarity yeah. It's almost yeah. the same as relationship. Right, but right, I'm, right. I'm curious how that works as well. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. no, yeah. Yeah, so we have more faith in the claim because we have multiple sources giving us the same information. That's what corroborative Corroborative, mean, yeah. See, for uh, um, going forward, I see a huge value in uh, using uh, corroborations across multimedia, mm -hmm. multimodal information. So different mm -hmm. sensors giving different things about the same problem the patient is facing. Hopefully it's the same problem. Uh, it's very, very good. Different um, um, you know, camera and uh, audio and others. You remember the picture you drew about uh, uh, the car, uh, you know, the vehicle on the road, the circle around that, and you know, there's a road level sensor and uh, satellite sensor and audio thing kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So. If you can corroboration, you know, get corroboration across all of them, uh, where of course everybody understands corroboration in terms of uh, space and time uh, based thing, but now domain aspect also saying, well, there may be a lot of potential signals, you know, noisy signals, but it's just about the car. In each of the sensors, you know, that I want to uh, try and corroborate. That's exactly right. You know. mm -hmm. So I, I think that the idea that. When we talk about text, the idea of um, corroborative is simple, right? It's like this, you know, si similarity of terms, the synonyms. But when we talk about sensor data, it begins yeah. to get fuzzy to me. Right. Um, so what, what that relationship really so, means. so that is why our Absolutely. approach works very well compared to anybody else. Uh, aware, uh, whatever the signals are, uh, at the slide that we have, uh, you know, is that we take different uh, signals. But then you, uh, let's say, create SSN, and the tags that are used is with regards to domain ontology. And of course, getting the tags right requires specialized processing. I'm looking for a certain feature that I can name, uh, label with a concept in my ontology, it requires uh, specialized processing. But if I have that for each of the different sensors, then I have different sensors talking potentially, uh, to the, assuming that this labeling is accurate, the same. Uh, thing and now I have a lot of different information that the person was in a room when the person was sleeping uh, the variation in uh, humidity uh, dust uh, any of the things that may affect um, um, you know uh, perhaps carbon uh, monoxide or dioxide all of those uh, wheezing measured by the nearby sensor um, all of them uh, are mapped to the you know, medical concept that you can talk about the doctor can look at and understand. And now we will have uh, much more. We we will be able to talk about it in 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 the way human communicate uh, with, with uh, not necessarily like natural language but concepts that are relevant. And now things will be a lot more meaningful to us without having to always um, uh, look at uh, numbers and, and 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 the analog signals. And the numbers can be converted into high or low or medium if that is what matters. Because maybe doctor does not care about precise. A level of wheezing issue, it matters it is high wheezing or medium uh, high wheezing or you know whatever five grades that you are doing, that machines can take care of it, bring us at that level of abstraction necessary for us to uh, then uh, you know 
You say, oh, this is medium high or high, I'll pay attention to that factor. Otherwise, I don't pay attention to that factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, that leads me to my second question. Um, so this medium, low, high, I'm guessing that comes from some background knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so throughout your talk, background knowledge seemed like it's a magical thing in the background. So anytime you needed some knowledge or some something you didn't know, you just kind of pointed to the background knowledge and say, oh, that's going to come from yeah. that thing. <laughs> so actually, slide 50 is the one I'm talking about. Um, How is the concluding slide? <laughs> Yeah, so you said the background knowledge provides some structure and parameters mm -hmm. um, to the system. Um, and somehow, magically, that reduces the complexity of the problem. Um, yeah, this one. Actually, that reduces the effort to build PGMs. It's not the, co the, p the complexity of the problem is dealt with PGMs in general, but to come up with probabilistic graphical models, it's similar to building an ontology. So you need a lot of, for this, you need a lot of data. But for ontology, you need domain experts. Okay, so this is how I understood it. You have this graph. Right. Model. You have this declarative knowledge. Yeah. You somehow combine the two, combine whatever is in that declarative knowledge, and all of a sudden, your graph is simplified. So instead of 16 links, you have eight links. Right. 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 Um, so I'm not sure. Simplified. Maybe more like, uh, more maybe graph made more meaningful. For example, mm -hmm. The background knowledge may allow us to label a link in the data the graph received from data. Actually, let me just uh, clarify that part again. Now, I think both of you are asking the right question there. So, PGMs, right? There are some limitations of PGMs. For example, let's say I'm given data, and that's the only thing I have about the domain, and I need to come up with the structure of PGM. Then in that case, I have some techniques to do structure extraction from data. Declarative knowledge is not just adding anything there, but it's crucial for us to disambiguate between different structures, because there are these different structures that have the same log likelihood score. What it means is that there are four different structures, for example, for describing a domain, but all of them are equally likely according to just the structure extraction algorithm. But now, Common sense dictates that one structure is more likely than the other. So in that case, declarative knowledge plays a crucial role for us to disambiguate that. Mm -hmm. And I spoke about this in the proposal defense, but I didn't stress on that here. Yeah, I think that's the, what I'm talking about. It's like, in this talk, I didn't really understand it. Right. But I don't understand it, but the talk didn't really specify. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. y yes, the, the it specified knowledge. two things. It specified two things. One is. How do you use declarative knowledge to build CRF models, which is a PGM, for which you learn parameters? So you did annotate data and did parameter extraction. And the second one it specified was that using declarative knowledge, how did you come up with structure for LDS models? Those are the two things that I discussed. I so guess. you could punt on this if you want. But, um, so you're using this declarative knowledge to filter, using your term, right? The problem is the graphical model. Um, and you're using concept map, for example. But I'm wondering what features of declarative knowledge actually allow that to happen. Right. So, for example, if right. I were to take concept map plot out right. and substitute in DBpedia, right. would it do better? Would it do worse? Right. Do I know it's going to do better or worse? Right. So it depends on what kind of PGM you're trying to build. We have investigated for Bayesian nets, which is most likely the links are causal in nature. So. ConceptNet is the one that has causal relationships for a domain. So this was the most appropriate model that we could use to do this disambiguation. However, if you ask me to use DBpedia for Bayesian Net, uh, I don't have any such links directly available to me. So it might be very challenging. This is the challenging. So well, I, I'm, I know intuitively you know, we were talking about this earlier, intuitively <laughs> you know ConceptNet is better than DBpedia. What I'm asking is, how do you prove that? How do you, how do you really know? Absence of that? so in my yeah in my def right, right 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 in my definition of declarative knowledge I gave an example of uh, declarative knowledge from ConceptNet which has this causal relationship is missing in DBpedia so that's uh, one observation I have right now but let me address this kind of thing probably in the in the chapter I guess yeah I, I just think that's a that's an interesting problem um, it's probably right. a problem beyond what's Right. I mean, there are different kinds of knowledge. One is causal, 
The other one is also this hierarchical, uh, just the vocabulary of the domain, right? So that can be used to annotate data and then learn parameters. So there are different kinds of knowledge, as you say, that are at play here. Could it be good to be specific about that? Perfect. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and my final is just a comment about the OODA loop. Um, Oh, I don't think I have to go to the beginning. Yeah, you have observe, orient, decide, and act. Yeah, and you, you talk about observe. And I, I like the way you brought everything together. Um, but there's a crucial piece missing, and that's that link going from act to observe. Yeah, order. that's right. To me, that's the most important, or that's the most interesting piece here. Right, um, right, right. It's completely just flat. So, out. yeah. So this feedback loop is not at all part of my dissertation. So I just said that I have three parts in my dissertation. All these things orient to this, but I did not talk about the feedback loop at all. So this was not in my dissertation. However, the action recommendation part uses Markov decision process, right? So you have set of states, set of actions. When a user performs an action, the world state changes. And that's what you observe again. So then. You decide what you need to do with that world state, recommend action, again observe. So there is that part of the story. To me, the feedback loop is kind of what you can learn based on the, the effect of your action. Right. 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 And how did your action affect the state of the world? Absolutely. Not right. Not just what the state of the world is, but your effect on it. Right. And how do you learn from that? Right. How do you integrate that learning into your overall system? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. I know it's, a, it's above and beyond what you wanted, but I would think if anybody is going to extend this work, right, right. that's the place to work. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. For example, the MDP models we have, we have parameterized it with some reward and cost matrix. What Corey is probably pointing toward is that how do you modify the cost and reward matrix, matrix as you go in this loop? So I think that's a very nice uh, extension to have. So, so what would happen is that in traffic kind of case, um, uh, usually you don't have much direct ability to observe the feedback. Uh, the independent drivers who make their own decisions, <laughs> policies out there doing any direction or whatever. Uh, in uh, things like asthma, we may have the opportunity to do that because right, uh, right, right. Uh, did the patient take medication yeah. that uh, is Pretty according reflective. to protocol doctor has specified when the system shows you orange color, take uh, this thing. Right. Uh, or right. uh, whether uh, you know uh, things, uh, patient you know, answers because you are uh, you're directly asking questions, right? Patients, right, right, right. Uh, yeah. Uh, then uh, or the pill popper uh, sensor tells mm -hmm. that okay, the pill was you know taken, medication taken. was taken, right? Then we will be actually able to uh, more uh, put in the feedback yeah. in that context in his data set. We did, we did right, there. right, right. Absolutely. So in our perception cycle, for example, we act and then we. Get another focus and then right. keep narrowing down uh, to the right. Uh, I, I think yeah. some people might have to leave, so uh, uh, we'll uh, excuse the audience. Uh, just remember uh, uh, homework. Um, tell me all the times, different times, um, that you could apply um, uh, no, uh, background knowledge in this kind of competition, and I can at least three of three times. So you know, you guys, uh, you know, uh, not you, uh, you know. Uh, no, we'll answer that question, okay? Okay, we'll, we'll talk after, after that. And okay, one second. Um, so all the uh, new PhD students, I invite you to join for lunch with Cody, uh, so hang around there.